This is the demonstration video for the pizza muffins. Your cooking principles are as follows. One, the muffin method of mixing. Muffins are mixed by the muffin method. The muffin method consists of three steps. Step one, we sift all our dry ingredients together. Step two, we combine all our liquid ingredients together. And step three, we make a well in the dry ingredients and add the liquids in all at once. Cooking principle number two, type of quick bread, quick and easy to make rises quickly because it uses baking powder to rise and not yeast. Leavening agents are ingredients that cause our products to rise. Baking powder is the leavening agent most frequently used in flour mixtures. It is a commercially prepared leavening agent made from an acid and a salt form, soda, which is usually sodium bicarbonate, and starch, which is usually cornstarch. When mixed with a liquid, they create carbon dioxide gas, which will cause our muffins to rise. Baking soda will act as a leavening agent when it's combined with another acidic substance, such as buttermilk or sour cream, vinegar, or even cream of tartar. When it's combined with one of these ingredients, it too will also produce carbon dioxide gas that will help raise our flour mixture, in this case, our muffins. Cooking principle number three. Muffins are an example of a drop batter. This describes the consistency of a muffin mixture before it goes in the oven. The mixture is thick enough to be dropped from a spoon, but too thick to be poured from a bowl. The reason why the mixture is this consistency is because there's approximately one part liquid ingredients to two part dry ingredients. Nutrition. Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are responsible for supplying the body with energy, sparring protein, and assisting the utilization of fats. Protein. It is essential for building muscle, repairing all types of body tissue, regulating body processes, forming antibodies to fight infection, and supplying your body with energy. Calcium is responsible for forming strong bones and teeth and maintaining and repairing the skeleton, maintaining muscle, tone, normal heartbeat and healthy nerve functions, and aiding normal blood clotting. Fat. Fat helps protect your body and insulate body parts such as major organs, supplies energy to your whole body, transports fat-soluble vitamins such as A, D, E, and K, and supplies your body with essential fatty acids needed for functioning. Vitamin C. It is essential for growth, development, and repair of the body tissue. It is also needed for the absorption of iron, proper functioning of the immune system, wound healing, and the maintenance of cartilage, bones, and teeth. Ingredients. 250 milliliters all-purpose flour. Gluten is the protein substance in flour, which forms strong elastic strands when mixed with the liquid. Heat will harden this protein and the muffin will be held in its risen state. 15 milliliters sugar. Sugar helps caramelize when subjected to the heat of the oven and turns your muffin golden brown. That way, you know when it's ready to come out of the oven. 7 milliliters baking powder. Baking powder is a leavening agent that when combined with a liquid will help produce the carbon dioxide gas needed to leaven our muffin. 1 milliliter baking soda. Baking soda is a leavening agent that when combined with an acid will create carbon dioxide gas. Today's muffin features yogurt, which is the acid that will activate the baking soda. 2 milliliters salt. Salt enhances the natural flavors found within any baking product. Today's muffin features both green peppers and old cheddar cheese, and we want them to pop as the main dominant flavor thanks to the salt. 2 milliliters dried basil. Basil is a sweet Italian herb that often pairs really well with tomatoes found within our pizza sauce and will add more complexity to our flavor profile in our muffin. 125 milliliters of old sharp cheddar cheese. Sharp cheddar cheese is aged longer than regular cheese and has a way more bolder dominant flavor. 
This allows us to use less cheese in our recipe and reduce our fat content in our muffin while still having a big bold flavor. 50 milliliters finely chopped green or red pepper. This is optional. This is one of our flavor for our filling today. We're using a bell pepper or capsicum as it's otherwise known around the world. Peppers are really high in iron and vitamin C. In fact, they have two to four times the amount of vitamin C than an orange. 125 milliliters plain yogurt. Using yogurt allows us to reduce the fat in our muffin today. It is also the acid needed to activate our baking soda. Yogurt is high in protein, calcium, vitamins, and live culture or probiotics, which is known to enhance your digestive system. 30 milliliters of margarine. This will have a tenderizing effect as it interferes with the development of the gluten. This will make our muffin soft. Using margarine instead of butter is better for our muffin today as we will be baking in a really hot high temperature oven and this will cause butter to burn, whereas margarine will not. One large egg. Egg contributes to the nutrition of the mixture, but also is known as an emulsifier. An emulsifier will bind two unlikely products together, such as the yogurt, which is mainly milk-based or water-based, and our melted margarine, which is like oil. 30 milliliters pizza sauce. Pizza sauce typically is an uncooked tomato sauce made up of pureed tomatoes, seasoned with salt and pepper, and other Italian herbs such as garlic, oregano, and basil. It is easier to spread on pizza, but in this case, the tops of our muffins. 60 milliliters of grated mozzarella cheese. Mozzarella is known for its mild flavor, its stringy texture, and its super cool melting ability. This has made it popular for using as a topping on pizza, and or in this case, our pizza muffins. These are all the ingredients you need to make the pizza muffins. Equipment. For this recipe, you will need a six cup muffin tin, six paper baking liners, shortening needed for greasing the muffin tin, wax paper, also for greasing the muffin tin, measuring equipment, including dry measures, a liquid measure, and small measures, metal spatula, rubber spatula, custard cups, metal pie plate, a sieve, a metal spoon, wooden spoon, large mixing bowl, medium mixing bowl, chef's knife, chopping board, a metal fork, oven mitts, hot mat, a cooling rack, and finally, toothpicks. Method. Bachette stands for the beginning steps that you need to do at the start of your lab. B stands for books and bags. They should be away either at the back of the classroom or under your table. A stands for apron, which you need to put on to help protect your clothing. S stands for sleeves. You need to roll them up past your elbows. H stands for long hair that touches the shoulders that needs to be tied back or hats that need to be removed. C stands for chairs that should be tucked under your table and out of your way. H stands for hands that should be washed properly for 30 seconds using hot water and soap. E stands for equipment which you should be getting out as quickly as possible without wasting time. And T stands for the towels that you need to pick up you need at least two dishcloths and two tea towels. Step one, use oven racks numbers four and number five. Preheat oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 200 degrees Celsius. To turn on the oven, press the bake button and then use the up arrow to select the desired temperature. 
Step two, prepare a muffin tin with baking liners or grease bottoms of muffin cups with shortening. Shortening does not burn as easily as margarine or butter because of its higher smoke point. So there are two ways to prepare your muffin tin. One, you can put the paper liners in. That makes an easy cleanup job and easier to dishwash the muffin tin at the end of the lab. However, when you peel off the paper, they often take the chunks of pepper and the large cubes of cheese out with them. Also, if you plan on freezing these muffins, freezing with the paper liners actually make it a little more difficult. Because I often suggest the students to make big batches of this muffin, it is better to freeze them without any paper liners in the freezer. So often I get you to grease them with shortening instead. But when you grease with shortening, you only want to do the bottoms only. You need to leave the sides free so that the dough can slowly climb and pull its way up out of the tin and rise easier. If the sides are greased, the dough often slips down and the full height will never be achieved. Step three, on a pie plate, sift large amount of flour. Measure 250 milliliters and sift again into a large bowl. Sifting adds air, secondary leavener, and gets rid of lumps. We sift flour for two reasons. Our first reason is we're going to remove any lumps found within our flour. Because we live on the west coast of Canada, right by the ocean, we tend to have a lot of moisture in our air and it lumps our flour. So we don't want to have that in our final baking product. So if we remove it now, we're making sure that our baking product has a nice even texture on the inside. The other thing we do to sift flour is we're adding in air. Air is so important to bake products because air pockets allow for the liquids to heat up and create steam and the steam pushes through the muffin, allowing it to rise. That's why it's called a secondary leavening agent. Baking powder typically is our main one. Now, as you remeasure your flour, you're going to notice that the air has replaced some of the volume and your measuring cup is full, even though you leveled it off, but there's still flour remaining in the pie plate below. That's because that's how much air we have replaced. Total volume of the air has made it so that we don't need all this flour anymore. This flour has been clean and untouched by baking powder, baking soda, salt, so we can put it back into our bucket and put it back into our unit to use for later. Then what we want to do is re-sift the flour into a large bowl. That way we can really maximize how much air we've added to the flour. Again, the more air pockets we add in, the better it is for our final baking product's texture overall. And we want it light, airy, and fluffy. Step four, lightly stir in the remaining dry ingredients, sugar, baking powder, baking soda, salt, and dried basil. Steps three and four are the first step of the muffin method. Baking powder with a liquid and heat produces carbon dioxide, primary leavener. Baking soda with liquid and an acid, yogurt, produces carbon dioxide. We're gonna add all the other dry ingredients to the large bowl. First, we're going to start off with the sugar, which we're using to help caramelize and color our muffins. That way we know when they're fully cooked because they turn golden brown. It's not a lot of sugar for a muffin. Muffins typically have quite a lot of sugar and fat in them, but it's still enough just to help us with the coloring. The next thing we're going to make sure we add is our two leavening agents. Now, they won't be activated at this point because they still need a liquid to get going and some heat. So you can add them in knowing that they're not starting to produce their carbon dioxide gas quite yet. We're going to add some salt and add some flavor. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to add in our basil. Now the trick with the dried herb is to you always put it into the palm of your hand and rub and crush it. This helps break up new surface areas and release extra flavor from the dried herb. If you're choosing to use a fresh herb instead of a dried one, you might want to add double the measurement just because dried herbs tend to be a little bit more concentrated than fresh ones. Give it a nice stir, make sure you're not being too rough and that you don't deflate all that lovely air that we just sifted into the flour mixture. Combining all our dry ingredients is the first step of the muffin method. Step five, cut old sharp cheddar cheese into tiny cubes. If using, finely chop red and green peppers. Stir into the dry ingredients. These should be roughly half a centimeter wide and all the same size. Let's start with cutting our cheese. 
Now this is an aged cheddar, which means it has less moisture content than regular cheese. We're still going to use a chef's knife and slice half a centimeter uh, slices along the block. Then using the chef's knife, I'll cut each slice into small little strips, again, that are half a centimeter wide. Make sure you're following the thickness because that way the cheese will be evenly distributed and it won't have a chance to melt fully. We want it to still stay in its cube pieces. Now you might notice that the cheese is a little bit sticky and it adheres to the knife blades. You will have to kind of push it off gently. Be mindful of where the sharp edge of the blade is. Once you have all of your cheese cut into small strips, stack them up into a smaller pile and we're going to go rock and chop, cut our way across the strips so that we have cubes all evenly done. We want to make sure all the pieces are even so that when we bite into our muffin, we get every one with a piece of cheese and a piece of pepper. Once your cheese is all cut, get a custard cup out and transfer all the cheese from the board to the custard cup. Let's cut up our pepper and we're going to use a paring knife because this is a soft fruit and vegetable. Start by taking the seed sack out. This is that white part inside a pepper. It's often very bitter and most people don't like to eat it when it's in any recipe. So we're going to remove it both out of the red pepper and the green. Then what we're going to do is using our paring knife, drag it along the length of the pepper, creating half centimeter strips. Once I've done the red, I'm going to make sure I do the green the same way. This way, when I can stack all the strips together and chop across them, making cubes that are all nice and even. We want to try to keep our width a half centimeter by a half centimeter when we do this. So that way, when I put it into my muffin with the cheese, we can get all the flavors in one bite. And that way, we're not missing either pepper or cheese. You can always double check by comparing your pepper pieces to the cheese that you've already cut. They should all be about the same size when we look at them. And here we are, looks like a good job. Then we're gonna grab our dry ingredients that are in the large bowl and throw in our peppers as well as the chopped up cheese. And we're gonna take a wooden spoon and slowly stir it all together. We wanna make sure we coat these filling ingredients with the flour so that way when it's cooking, they don't sink completely down to the bottom of the muffin. When the flour is coating them, they'll stay suspended in the batter. Put it off to the side. Step six, in a custard cup, melt margarine in the microwave for 20 to 25 seconds on high. So we're going to measure our margarine using the liquid displacement method. Here, I have a liquid measure that I put 100 milliliters of cold water into. I'm looking at it at eye level and I'm slowly going to lower margarine into the liquid measure, pushing it underneath the water line. Usually I try to use the spoon to adhere it to the bottom of the liquid measure. If I don't do this, it will float on the top and I won't be measuring it properly. So as I push the butter in, what happens is the volume in the cup changes. So instead of being 100 mils of water, the water line will slowly rise up. And if I want 30 mils of margarine, I want that line to go up to 130 milliliters. That way I know I have 30 milliliters of butter in the liquid measure. Once you're done and you have the correct measurement, you're going to take your cup and drain off the excess water because that's not part of our recipe. Don't worry, it won't stick to the margarine. And here we are, our 30 mils properly measured margarine. Now, transfer your margarine into a custard cup so that we can put it into the microwave for 20 to 25 seconds. If you don't have a custard cup at home, make sure the dish is microwavable safe. When you're doing this, listen for your pop sounds. If the margarine's making too many of them, it means it's exploding all over your microwave and that means a big mess for you to clean up. Doing it at 10 second bursts is a good way to make sure that you're avoiding that from happening. When you are done microwaving your margarine, you might notice that most of it is melted, but there's still a wee bit that isn't. Just use a spoon to quickly stir that in. It will slowly melt the remaining. We want to make sure that we cool this margarine down before we add it to our liquid ingredients. If we add it too early, it might accidentally cook our egg before it's in our muffin. And that's something we don't want to have happen. Step seven, in a medium bowl, beat egg with a fork. Stir in the yogurt and the melted margarine. 
This is the second step of the muffin method. Now, let's gather all our liquids together in the same bowl. First, in the medium bowl, I'm gonna crack open our egg. Notice how I just cracked it on the countertop, not on the side of the bowl. Often, when students crack their egg on the side of the bowl, they accidentally get eggshell flinging into the mixture, and then someone always ends up eating that part, and that's not very pleasant. Then, using a metal fork, give it a good stir. Considering that the emulsifying properties of an egg is technically in the yolk, we want to make sure it's well combined. Remember, this egg will bring together our oil, which in this case can be melted margarine, and our water product, which in this case is our yogurt, together. So we want to make sure it's all ready to go. Now we're going to measure out our yogurt. Now yogurt is technically a really thick liquid, so we're using a liquid measure. Use a metal spoon to help direct it into the center so that you can clearly read the measurement at eye level. If you need to, you can always tap the liquid measure to make sure everything is laying flat. Just make sure you're at eye level when you're reading the measurement. And if you need to, you can slowly bring some of it out. Then we're gonna add this to our egg. I'm gonna use a rubber spatula to help scrape it out of the liquid measure. That way I'm not wasting any of this behind. Make sure I have my complete measurement. It's the yogurt that's gonna make our baking soda reaction happen. So we wanna make sure we have all of it. Then I'm gonna add in my melted margarine and hopefully it's cool enough now so that way my egg doesn't cook. Give everything a really good stir, make sure everything's well blended. And here you see that my yogurt and my melted margarine are combining together, thanks to the egg. Step eight, make a well in the center of the dry ingredients. Pour liquids into the well all at once. With a wooden spoon, stir until the dry is moistened and no dry spots remain. The batter should be very thick. Do not over mix. Batter should look lumpy. This is the third step in the muffin method. Over mixing will cause air tunnels, smooth and peak tops, and or compact and heavy, tough and dry muffins. Now, with my dry ingredients, I'm going to use the wooden spoon to slowly create a well, which is essentially a hole in the center for me to pour my liquids into. Then, make sure you have a rubber spatula handy because you're gonna pour the liquids in all at once. And we don't wanna leave some behind in the bowl, so make sure you scrape all along the sides. Now, back with a wooden spoon, we're going to gently combine these two together. You don't wanna to go too vigorous or else you're gonna actually cause the gluten to overactivate. Now, in any big product, we do want some gluten to form, but when you activate it too much by being vigorous, it actually will cause the gluten to stretch out and cause great tunnels and holes to be made in your muffin. And that's a quality that we don't want. So just go until you notice all the dry ingredients are moistened. The batter still looks very thick and it's very lumpy and coarse. This is actually a good quality of a drop batter. If the batter is runny, you overmixed it. Step nine, spoon batter evenly into prepared muffin tin. Group of three, fill any empty muffin cups half full with cold water. Wipe any spilt batter from the muffin tin with a damp dishcloth. So what you wanna do is you wanna use two spoons to help drop the batter into the prepared muffin tin. It's important that you make each muffin contain the same amount of batter. That way they'll bake evenly in the oven and you won't have one that's overdone or underdone. So take a moment to take a look at each muffin cup. If you notice that one is more full than the other, take your spoon and distribute the batter evenly. You want to make sure this happens before we pop it into the oven. Make sure you use all the batter, don't leave anything behind in the bowl. The last thing I want you to do is take a damp dishcloth and wipe down any batter that might have gotten on the top of the tin. That way it doesn't burn, making it harder to wash afterwards. Step 10. Grate mozzarella cheese. Spoon 5 milliliters of pizza sauce on top of each muffin. Sprinkle with grated mozzarella cheese. So what we want to do is grate our mozzarella cheese on the large circle side of the grater. Make sure you go very slow, being mindful of your fingertips. Mozzarella cheese tends to be very, very soft. So when you get down to the end, it is very easy to push it through the grater with a flat hand. If you go very slowly, you will not harm yourself. What you wanna make sure though, is you get all the cheese out from the inside of the grater because it is so soft, 
it will be stuck pretty much to the inside. Once you have grated all the cheese, gather it all up into a custard cup so that you can use it for the toppings of your muffins. Next, I would like your special duties to measure out the pizza sauce from the demonstration table in a custard cup and bring it back to your unit. I want you to spoon about 5 milliliters of pizza sauce on the top of each muffin. Make sure you divide it equally and if you have to, use a rubber spatula to help get it out of the custard cup. At the very end, once all muffins have been topped with the pizza sauce, you can use the back of the spoon to gently spread it around a little bit. If you don't, it tends to spread and go down one side of the muffin while baking. It might create a mess on the top of your muffin tin. Then, go back to every single muffin, topping with the grated mozzarella cheese. Be mindful that none of the cheese falls onto the top of the muffin tin. It will burn and cause a greater mess for your dishwasher. So make sure if any cheese falls down, you go back and pick it up, pop it back onto a top of a muffin. Once all your muffins have the toppings, then you can put it into the oven for baking. Step 11. Bake for 20 to 25 minutes. If filled more than three-fourths full, bake longer. To set the timer on the oven, first click the timer on off button. Then use the up and down arrows to set the time that you need for your baking. Once you let go of the on off arrows, your clock will then begin ticking down in seconds. Step 12. Cool muffins in the tin for five minutes before transferring them to a cooling rack to cool completely. You can freeze any extra muffins in an airtight container for up to one month to frost at room temperature. Let's put a hot mat down to protect our countertop from the hot muffin tin. Then we'll do our test for dentists to make sure that our muffins are fully cooked. If not, we'll pop them back in for an extra five minutes. Insert a toothpick and see if it comes out clean. Also, a touch test. See if the muffins spring back. If all is well, cool for five minutes. Once your muffins have cooled for at least five minutes, you should be able to take two forks and gently pry your muffins out of the muffin tin. If you need to, run them underneath any melted cheese that may have slipped down off your muffin while it rose in the oven. We want to make sure we cool them completely on the cooling rack because inside will be hot cubes of old cheddar. And if you try to eat them right away, not only will the old cheddar be quite scalding hot, but the tomato sauce on the top might burn the roof of your mouth. So give it some time, let them cool before eating. The yield for this recipe is six muffins. Groups of three, nine muffins. Tests for doneness. One, the top of the muffin will spring, bounce back quickly when lightly pressed with a finger. Two, a toothpick inserted into the center of the muffin will come out dry and clean. Three, sides of the muffin will shrink away from the muffin tin. Standards. One, slightly bumpy, pebbly, round top, not smooth and peaked. This is caused by not over mixing your dough and making sure that you mix until it's just moistened. If you over mix, you'll activate the gluten, causing smooth tops. Two, moist texture, not dry. This is achieved by making sure that you've measured all your liquid ingredients properly and that you have the proper amount of dry ingredients to liquid. This is also achieved by not over mixing your batter, causing the gluten to be activated. Three, tender, breaks easily and is not heavy or tough. This texture is only achieved by not over mixing your batter. A properly mixed muffin will be really soft and have a nice even crumb structure in the middle. It should be moist, but still have a nice bite to it. Four, no air tunnels. Air tunnels are often achieved by over activating the gluten. You do need some gluten to provide structure to your muffin, but too much causes it to stretch out during the baking process, leaving giant air tunnels 
throughout the muffin. 5. Golden Brown This is achieved by making sure that you greased your pan properly and you added the correct amount of sugar. You should have some caramelization on your final product. Take a look at this picture. It's the bottom of my muffin. It is neither burnt nor is it undercooked. It is a perfect color of golden brown. These are all the standards for the pizza muffins. Let's take a look at a demonstration muffin. What we notice first thing is that the top is very bumpy, slightly rounded, no peak tops. The bottom has a lovely golden brown color. Also what we notice is that the structure is very set, has a lovely spring back to it. We can see how much the muffin rose in the tin just by looking at it, which means we didn't over mix and it's perfect. When we cut it in half, we'll take a look at the inside structure. What we see is a nice, dense, compact crumb structure, no air tunnels. That means this muffin was mixed the perfect amount and that we didn't overactivate the gluten. These savory pizza muffins are great for a lunch or a quick snack when you need them. They freeze easily and heat up just as well. I hope you had as much fun making them as I did. Happy baking and thanks for watching.